Great. Thank you, Sahini. Uh, at least your phone going off reminded me to um, put my phone on uh, <laughs> silent as well. Um, imagine uh, Lisa may have done the same. Um, people, um, Lisa is one of those people, every time I see her, I become like a, a, a friendly dog with its tail wagging. I'm always just happy to see her. Um, and um, we're going to uh, segue to a conversation about her experience uh, right now as spiritual lead at Plymouth Uni. But in the first place, I want to explore her background and how she kind of got here. And I also want to say uh, congratulations, Lisa, because I know you exchanged contracts on a new home last yeah. week, eh? which uh, is great. I also want to say congratulations because I think it's congratulations. I heard. Did you have the carol service last night or not? Yes. Yes, yeah. we did. And it all went very well. All yeah. right. So, so there we have Lisa, <laughs> spiritual, not religious, landing at Plymouth Uni, which normally has an ordained clergy person at oh. its lead. And your first job was to um, lead and organise a carol service. Mm. And it was OK. Yeah, went very well. That's great. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yes. All right. So listen, we're, we're going to talk about your history and how your history then takes you to being spiritual lead in the hospice and then from the hospice to Plymouth okay. Uni. Okay. So would you tell us a little bit about what, what kind of family you come from and what it was like for you growing up and what kind of woke you up so that you became interested in both caring for people and also spirituality? Um, okay. A, um, well, I, so I come from a small family, very small family. Um, I have one, one younger sister, grew up, my mum and dad lived together, so we lived together as a family until I was in my early teens, and then they separated, so I, it was my mum living with my sister and I, and my mum has one brother, my dad's an only child, so we were always a really small family, no big family get-togethers, really not very many of us. And I was, if I think about, well, my family are not, not religious and spirituality was never talked about. It just didn't feature in my mum and dad's vocabulary. It's not something that people around me ever talked about. But when I was about seven years old, someone from the local church came round, you know, introducing themselves to everybody in the street. And I begged my parents to be allowed to go to Sunday school. I was just desperate, wanting to connect with something. And I don't think really knowing at that age what that was, but just feeling something about what that was. So for a while, I went to church and went to Sunday school. And then that realised that wasn't for me. That was an Anglican church. Can I ask, did, did you have because some children do, did you feel a connection with Jesus in that situation? <sighs> well, look, you're thinking. No, I don't think so. I think, I think what I was aware of was the sense of community and belonging. That's, mm -hmm. I think, what, what I remember from that time, that being part of a community that, that shared something, but the, the vocabulary of it all, didn't really resonate with me very, very strongly at that time. I think it probably does more now, even though I'd still would say, wouldn't describe myself as religious or Christian in any way. But I then, I decided it wasn't right and stopped going. And then in my late teens, started going to church again and went to a Methodist church really because a family friend that I was very close to, a friend of my parents, um, went to that church and she was somebody that I really admired and looked up to. So in my seeking, she seemed like a person to kind of follow really in terms of where she went. And somehow I held all of that alongside being quite a punk teenager. Um, I'd be out on a Saturday night very wacky, drinking too much, partying too much, um, 
having spent the day on marches and protests, I was quite a punk, quite an activist. And then on Sunday morning, I'd turn up at church with a terrible hangover mm. um, and hang out there and feel for a long while felt very accepted there. But then started to realize that although I felt accepted, I heard a lot of people making a lot of judgment about other people that I related to. And I felt like this isn't the place for me. I'm accepted because I come to church. But if I wasn't, I wouldn't be accepted by these people. And that put me off going. So I stopped going to church at maybe 20, age of 19, 20, and just decided it wasn't, wasn't for me. So, so can I ask again, in, mm. in the middle of that experience where you were sniffing at community that was meaningful mm. for you, were you also having a parallel sniff at, oh, there's something in the universe, something different, something? Yes, I, so I worked at that time, my first work, when I failed my, I failed my A-levels and retook them. So I, my- I, I did, I did too. Yay! <laughs> it's great, badge of mm. honor. I, in the year that I was retaking them, I volunteered at a college for young people with visual impairment. And then I stayed on and worked there for years. I worked there for 12 years in total. But while I was there, it was at a time when in, in education, in specialist education, they were really starting to introduce things like guided visualization, meditation, um, and other kind of more alternative aspects of spirituality to the students as a well-being practice and so I got very involved in doing that and found that that was something I really did connect with and that felt like spoke to me much more clearly I think but it's strange because I can't really say there was a time when I had a spiritual awakening or a or found a place because I still don't feel like I found my spiritual home. I still feel like some part of me is looking for a spiritual community that I'm part of. And I'm envious of people who are religious because they feel able to subscribe to that. But for me, it's been a very solitary path of resonating with some aspects of practices in different spiritual communities, but never feeling like I find anything where I go this is my home this is home for me and I think I'm still looking for that and still struggling with not having it oh. and that feels quite woo saying that well, that's, that's the beginning of <laughs> another mm. conversation isn't mm. it? I mean yeah I'm, I'm surprised that you don't assert to yourself that you just feel at home in the cosmos and maybe not in human communities, you know. A lot of mystics are solo voyagers, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. And a lot, much of the time, maybe I feel very comfortable. But when I try to talk about it and articulate it, I find a lot of the language really problematic. And I think it also goes alongside my sexuality so so being gay but not I didn't come out until I was 30 but was exploring that over a long time I think there was always that way in which I didn't have a sense of belonging to so there's been some that that seeking belonging and wanting to be part of a community has been a big factor in my life in different ways I think mm. and I'm I've find it difficult to I can't separate out and say this is my spiritual path and this is my career path and this is that, that's not how I've done anything in my life so yeah I am mostly comfortably with comfortable with being solitary but there are times when it's lonely and I feel lonely and wish that I could sit into something oh, isn't yeah. that, the, that is so much the human condition yeah. for people doing spiritual development actually, mm. that, that we're becoming you know getting comfortable with being independent and autonomous and yet at yeah. the same time we yearn 
It came out of mummy's tummies, you know, we're yeah. very fleshy yeah. communal people, aren't we? So there's mm. always that pull. Anyway, yeah. so there you are in your yeah. early 20s. Yes. And what happens? Did you go to uni? No. I've never been a full-time student at uni. <laughs> you became an academic. How did you pull that off? I, I don't even I don't enough. even have a degree. No. I don't have a degree. <laughs> but you became an a lecturer. Yes. So I while I was working at this college for visually impaired students, I started off helping out and supporting in classrooms and then realized that wasn't where I wanted to be. And I moved across and worked in the residential part of the college. So I was teaching living skills and supporting students in their residential environment. But then I spent a lot of time talking with the counsellor at the college and there was just something different about her, about the way that she related to people, the way she talked about the students, just the way she was, the way she listened, her presence. And I thought, I want, I want what you do. I want, that's what I'm looking for. That's what I want. And when I talked to her, what I discovered from her was that it was Carl Rogers' person-centered approach. And so I trained as a counselor because that was the only place you could really go to learn about the person-centered approach. It only, it, 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 the training was counseling training. So that's where I found myself. And that was through my career at the college. I changed roles within the college, but stayed in that area of work. And then somehow, because, I, because I'd done my professional training, um, I managed to persuade um, U University of East Anglia to let me onto a master's in counselling without having done an undergraduate degree. So that's how I kind of got myself back into an academic. Oh, r respect. <laughs> respect. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. And respect to that uni for letting you bypass the normal entrance procedures. It's yeah. great. Yeah, it was great. And I think, I don't know how things are, so whether they're so easy now, but I think it was a time when it, certainly in counselling and psychotherapy and at places like UEA, they were really wanting to be creative and innovative and encourage people to come in in different ways. And that, that was yeah. so. That was kind of what, year, what year was that? Was that of interest? 1998 I started okay. that yeah. yeah yeah and it was a so there was a big collision so I was doing my master's had been working as a counsellor but having always worked in this little college this little residential college with 150 students um doing my master's and then I came out I met my long-term partner that I was with for 18 years um that was the end of my relationship with my daughter's father so so that I had this big sort of mess of like my whole life sort of fell apart well I took it to pieces and put it back together again at that point in a, around 2000 around the millennium and and then I carried on working as a a therapist in charities in lots of different settings but always with always with a focus on working with marginalized people so I've worked with young asylum seekers I worked in young people young people's drop-in and advice services I worked in the HIV sector and sexual health field um, I then went to work for a hospice where I set up a service for children pre-bereavement support for children and then I and then I went sort of back and forth in academic settings. So I spent two blocks of five years teaching counselling and psychotherapy in a university and loving it, but ultimately also then really missed being a practitioner. And so I kind of moved back and forth between the two until about five years ago. And at that point, I decided that I wanted to go back and be a practitioner and I saw another job within a hospice and applied for the job that I had previously to this so I worked for a hospice in the Midlands and initially started as their psychological support lead so that was my my role when I went there and I felt really drawn to being there because I'd missed I'd missed being a practitioner, but also I'd had some, some experiences of 
bereavement and death and dying in my personal life, death of people who were close to me, my, right from my grandfather and then other people. I'd led a funeral for somebody who wanted a humanist funeral. And I just felt like this is an area where I've got some growth to do, but also something I know that I can contribute. And so that took me back into the hospice alongside having developed a spiritual practice and a creative practice using expressive arts in my work. So let me, let me pause you there and let, let me sniff around a bit. At what, what was your spiritual practice and how did you get into it? Okay. Um, and recognising that it threads into it's, your life. It's in and out and I kind of have to go back yeah. a bit. So I'd, in my 20s, I became interested in shamanic work and went and did some a, a year-long course in contemporary shamanism excuse me and then again there was something I really liked about that I think I liked its earth-based the earth-based practices I liked being back in a community where there were rituals and ceremonies and and practices of coming together for rites of passage that's something that I felt was really important but the courses that I did were often drew on North American shamanic practices and felt like they didn't quite relate to me but I discovered that I loved movement I really loved movement as a as a form of spiritual practice so trance dance any ecstatic dance free movement just music always was a really wonderful experience for me and I then was doing other professional development trainings in using expressive arts as a counsellor but as part of that which I did in the states I discovered that creative work was a real spiritual practice for me so I do a lot of expressive drawing I'm not an art I'm not an artist by training I don't have technical skills particularly but I use art and writing and movement as a form of spiritual practice and then ground that in stillness and meditation and time in nature. So one of my main spiritual practices today is I walk five miles every day with my dog and I just go out and be in nature, whatever the weather together and we just walk and be. And that's one of the most significant practices I have, I think. Yeah. Let me, let me mm. before we move on, Yeah. And, and this is a kind of tricky, you may not be able to articulate it, Okay. But let me let me just explore. When you're walking in nature with your dog and doing what you call spiritual practice, mm -hmm. what makes it spiritual as opposed to just taking the dog for a walk? For you. Okay. Can you articulate that? I think I'm I can articulate parts of it maybe. Yeah it's intentional so I go so I, I take her out I Maddie my dog comes to work with me I take her out in the middle of the day that's not a spiritual practice necessarily but in the mornings when I go out it's intentional my intention is this is a time to set myself up for the day I make a point of looking for beauty so of trying to really be aware of my environment and noticing what's around me and with a conviction that there is beauty in the world around me and and I just have to be open to seeing it and of course then there are times when like in sitting meditation sometimes I can be open and still other times there's a sort of reflective process going on and some of that but it it's an intentional practice to kind of do those things and just be aware of my feet on the ground things like that so it changes a bit according to what I feel I need on a particular mm. day Thank you, thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, that's right. So, m m moving on, you're, you're in the hospice. <laughs> yes. And so, then, and well, then. Well, as you know, so I'd, I'd done the spiritual companions courses and really enjoyed that, and that was a really 
important part of my spiritual development and my professional development I think just make getting more comfortable talking about spirituality in my work in my work as a therapist so but then at the hospice what Well, what happened was that my I went in and the manager of my team, who we were called the family support team, was part time the chaplain and part time the manager. And I worked very closely with him. He was an Anglican priest, worked very closely with him for a while. And then he left. And so there was a vacancy in the in the team and I applied for it and got it. So. I went from sort of having a psychological support focus to also being the manager of spiritual care and spiritual support in the team. And that meant then that I needed to work really closely with the volunteer chaplains that we had. And that just felt like it was subtle, but it was another shift in my move from therapy to work that has a more ex explicitly spiritual focus or an explicitly spiritual conversation kind of embedded within aspects of the work I think. What a fortunate move. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right time, right place. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. I'm really, really blessed to have that opportunity. And so the, another important strand that's gone alongside that has been that I, I started to really think that I feel limited in my work as a therapist to really feel that. So particularly in hospice work, like I could work with a client, a patient before they died, a family member of someone who's dying or a bereaved person. And I knew that I could help them explore and express their grief but increasingly what I felt was that this person doesn't need a therapist what they need is a community of people who are loving and caring and understand and actually more and more what I've become convinced of is my place is facilitating people to develop peer support networks, community spaces, and to just develop kind of loving, loving communication. It's like, it's not, there's a need for therapy and I still have a small practice, but actually people need each other. People need to be in communities where they feel loved and respected to have friends and family and good people around them who care. And so the spiritual work and the move into that allowed me to really explore in a broader way what are those qualities of therapeutic listening, spiritual practice and community that, that can kind of weave together to help establish that. Mm. Sounds really inspiring and lovely. It's lovely to listen to, mm. to hear you saying that. Okay. It, and then the job got advertised for Plymouth. What happened then? Oh, that. <laughs> well, that was odd. So again, I I hadn't looked on the academic jobs website for for the whole four years I'd been at the hospice. But other things had changed in my life. My children grown up, left home, living independently, doing what they do. Um, I there was no reason for me to need to stay living in any particular part of the country. I'm single. It's, it's me. I'd got the freedom to do that. And one day I looked on the site and there was this job at Plymouth that said, um, my job is the pastoral and spiritual support coordinator. It's a very ridiculously long title, but, um, and I just saw it and I thought that's where I need to be next. That's my next place to be. And, and so I applied for it didn't really, well, having read the application and written my application, wasn't really sure that I had much chance of getting an interview, um, but did. Had an interview. In preparation for that, read they'd, the year before, and so this would be 2019, there'd been a big report written about chaplaincy and past spiritual support in universities and higher education. That basically said, I think 
they talked to 360 people for this study and 0.8% of chaplains who were employed in universities, 0.8% would identify as having no religion. That's how unusual it is. So I just thought, I've got no chance of getting this job. They don't, you don't put someone who's not ordained in this job. But fortunately, I mean, and progressively, I think for Plymouth, they had really started to look at broadening out what the scope of what they were offering, wanting to make sure that what they were what they provide would be relevant and feel relevant to the student population and so they wanted to break down some of the barriers that they'd had in student feedback about accessing that kind of support so, so let, let me ask i'd love to can I ask you a question about that do, do you know who in the university hierarchy was responsible or what committee was responsible for opening up their vision about what was needed? How high up was it? Or was it inside the, what had been the chaplaincy team or the HR team? Or, it's, you know? so, so I come under what's called academic registry, which so, and student services. So anything that doesn't belong to a faculty of education um, comes under there. So it was kind of senior people in there. The vice chancellor had to approve it. Um, she it's important to her that the university is a secular university although she is a person of faith she's a christian and some christian elements and of like the carol service happening are important to her was, was she on the interview panel no no it was staff within student services so the head of student well-being services and yeah. student services as well as the from hr um, the manager for um, equality, diversity and inclusion. And so, yeah, th there was a real, I think what had happened was they'd had feedback from students that people perceived the chaplaincy as Christian. They'd always employed Christian chaplains and mm -hmm. who, who worked very hard to be inclusive, yeah. but that hadn't changed. And so, They'd, they'd revisited their whole description and decided to try and do something different. And did that angle them towards also having a woman? Um, and were you explicit about your sexuality? Or did that come into the application? Yes, there was. I'd written that in my application. Yeah. Um, so they were def definitely up for a shift yeah, then, because you're, you're, you're coming from... Yeah. A history of male ordinance, mm. and suddenly they hear that they need to be more inclusive, yeah, more multicultural, more celebrate, more celebratory of diversity, and you pop up, yes, spiritual, not religious, not ordained, female, yes, yay, yay, yes. The only thing that's kind of mainstream about you is your ethnicity, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Oh. I mean, they asked some great questions in my interview. Um, well, give I us an example. What was the, what okay. was the best question? The, so the third question, after two that were the sort of usual, what's made you interested in this job? You know, what skills would you bring? The third question was, what's your stance on Black Lives Matter? And what have you, how have you been involved in that movement? Oh. I was just like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so we had a silver lining to the culture wars. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, because the culture wars are so hot in unis with students. Yeah. So this was a kind of peace offering to the students. Yes. Hey, that's really it's really interesting because I would hope I want to see what happened with you happening all over the place. Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. And then they asked me what my stance on evangelism would be. Well, what did you say? I said that I, I strongly believe in people having freedom of religious expression, but that people being safe and included always trumps that and has to come first. But, but that, and that, that's my bottom line. That will always be my bottom line position. Or oh, you're taking us into such a hot <laughs> area of the culture yeah. wars, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. 
You want people to feel safe and included. And then you've got all the kids now saying, well, don't, don't say anything rude about whatever it is or we'll cancel you. Yeah. So you're, you're right in the middle of that very delicate cultural predicament or do, does that not land on you? Well, it does. Of course it does. It does in my intentions. It does. It informs everything. I think that I, it, I try to have it inform everything that comes into my work that the world's changing and young people's world is that I mean I just think they're so they're inheriting a world that's you know in climate emergency we're in you know their education has been impacted by the pandemic they're they're living in a world where we're global through the internet and social media and all of that but but it's hugely challenging and problematic and yet they're making these huge strides to talk about what they mean what you know what we mean what do they mean might you know they talk their what am i trying to say um the young people i meet are majority are just in a different place like I I grew up in the 80s you know dealing with Thatcher Clause 28 all those battles you know working through getting you know over years working to a place where you can have gay marriage and then my niece who's 15 said to me a couple of weeks ago I don't like that J. Ray, J.K. Rowling. And I said, why is that? And she said, she's transphobic. It's like, and it's just in her vocabulary to want to talk about inclusion of trans people, to want to talk about culture, difference, diversity, to just accept it. It's like, I, yes, she'll have a conversation about it, but young people are just in a different place, I think. And, and we've got to be relevant to them. Like we've got to be that in spiritual care, because if we're not, we're going to remain as irrelevant as churches for a lot of them. And so how do you be relevant to them? Because one of the threads I wanted to explore with you was there you are in a role that is explicitly one of giving spiritual care, which in the first place is um, <clears throat> listening and acceptance yeah. and being there in a, in a way of co-presence. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we were talking, last time we spoke, we were talking about the fact that the some of your chaplaincy team and some of the teams that I've met in hospices, right? So you get, get, you get folk who are evangelical Christians yeah, or, or evangelical Muslims or, you know, but when they're with someone who's suffering, you know, they'll, they'll pause, all yeah. their mental stuff gets put to the side mm. and they're just a kind, mm. companionable creature. Yeah. Now that's no different is it from what you're saying about how you need to be with a 18 year old swift yeah. in the, in this mm. strange demanding unstable world you know isn't it the same skill set i think it is the same skill set absolutely because what we're sorry where, where our conversation went next mm. was we, we still have minds, so, so we're, 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 we're multi-functioning when we're giving care to someone. And I'm, I always, you know, so if I'm giving care to someone who is, has decided J.K. Rowling as a transphobic, blah -de blah needs to be cancelled, right? Yes. And I actually, fact, want to have a conversation with this person to point yeah. out what, what J.K. Rowling actually said. You know? Yes, absolutely, yeah. You know, uh, but I'm not, I'm zipping that up. Yeah, yeah. 
and I'm just being caring and present, right? And I was wondering whether the, the, the men, the male chaplains who are Christians, were basically doing the same. They're just zipping up, not saying, not saying, well, actually, Jesus is the only way, you know? And I just, I just, I'm wondering about in, in your role, whether, you know, we, we put on hold these thoughts about, well, actually, what they're thinking is, and saying is not right. Whether that's kind of vibing at them, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of a passive aggressive patronizing, you know, yes, I'm going to listen to you and pretend I agree with everything you say because you need kindness and <clears throat> acceptance. But in actual fact, I don't agree with what you're saying. And in, and, in, and in not saying, I don't agree with what you're saying, you're actually being patronizing. Okay. And you, it's, if it's, it's not really, authentic. Or that's what you felt. I said, well. I don't know. It's a discussion that I want to yeah. like, explore here. I think it can be that. Yeah. I haven't experienced that in the team that I work with. So I, I've come in eight, eight months ago now. and some of the team of chaplains that are there are we're already in, there we're coming you know they come in they work in local churches or they're ministers in local churches and they come in and spend half a day a week with us and then others are new and they they've just you know because of people's jobs have changed or because i've recruited new people um i find them to be genuinely kind. I've been upfront with our, you know, the first time I met our Catholic chaplain, we had a conversation about my background, my history with my experience of Christianity, my um, ambivalence about religion particularly related to my sexuality and acceptance um some of my struggle with the stance of the catholic church about sexual orientation and and the fact that that leaves me in a place where i can feel mistrustful of people of faith of the catholic church and angry and all sorts of things and my experience was he he didn't defend he listened he listened and 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 what felt very authentically and warmly wanted to understand what my experience had been and and that's what i've felt in my team uh, that it's genuine it is genuine it doesn't feel patronizing and and the students that i see will feed back that they have felt the same. So I've, there are students who come in regularly and will say to me, I, didn't, I haven't been in here for two years. I didn't think this was a place for me because I'm not religious, because I don't fit, because I have had bad experiences of religious or religion or spirituality in the past. But I've come in and yeah, somebody was nice to me. But then now I come in three times a week and everybody's nice, everybody's kind and everybody's nice on the different days that they're here. Okay. And that's thrown me. It's, I've had to deal with a lot of my judgments about this. I've been like, oh, Lisa, come on. <laughs> All right. Let, let, can, can, I, can I poke around a bit more in it? So, <laughs> so and I, I, I think what you just, I, I know exactly what you mean. And I, I buy it, mm. and I've got a but that mm. I'm ex that I'm exploring. I'm, I'm not really sure what I think about it. And, and the but that I'm exploring is that that Catholic priest who had the skills, the life skills, the emotional literacy skills to be able to listen to you mm. and communicate to you that he had heard you that he might half an hour later in another situation mm. or privately be going, Jesus is the only way. 
Yeah. Jesus is the only way. Yeah. And um, equally, a Methodist might be yeah. doing that, or or a Muslim might be doing it, or or a Reiki practitioner might be doing yes. it. You know. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm trying to hone in on is this business of they've learned the Rogerian skills of co-presence, you know, mm -hmm. uh, acceptance, all that stuff, right? When they're in relationship, take them out of relationship and their ideology is not congruent, actually. It's, it's evangelical, it's deterministic, it's whatever it is, right? Okay. And I'm just, well, the, the jigsaw I'm trying to put together is how is that authentic? You know, they've got listening skills here, but over here they're ideologues, right? Um, and I, I do the same sometimes around COVID, right? I'm not, you know, yeah. f forget where I actually stand on COVID, but if I'm with someone who dis disagrees on, about something in a certain way, there's a part of my mind going, eh -eh. you know, but I know how to hold space and be listening. And I'm just exploring this as a kind of reflective issue for us, especially in the context yeah. of we know that great care is given in a in a way that deconstructs the power dynamic you know yeah and the moment someone is thinking privately i'm right they're wrong <laughs> <laughs> but i'm always right william <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah me too everybody listening is as well but I, I, maybe maybe i'm just talking about the fact hey get over it william it's too nuanced that's just the ambivalence of being human get on with it be kind full stop i don't wonder if actually you're you're equating that co-presence and those regerian skills with agreeing with people and i don't think that you have to do that in order to be kind and listening and understanding and accepting I, as a therapist i've spent years listening to many, many people in real depth, where my role is to understand their world as they experience it. I don't have to agree with them to be able to understand that. And I think I find more of that in, my, in the team than maybe I anticipated there would be. I think I went in with real judgments and defensiveness about, I was anticipating having to really fight my corner and was quite defensive, but I do, experience them and i think i know in myself that you can listen and be empathic and deeply deeply alongside someone trusting that they are on their own journey and supporting them in that without having to agree with them they're not mutually exclusive so i'm, I'm going to reframe mm. my bewilderment at the ambivalence of being human in those situations. I, you know, the way I'm going to reframe it is, I think I'm going to reframe it as when I or you, when we're giving care and being kind, our opinion about what's right and wrong to do with JK Rowling or yeah. COVID or whatever it is, our opinion really doesn't matter. Because no. all, that, all that really matters is just being kind in the moment mm. just being kind and i know that i mean i live in a town where there are covid wars yeah it's very polarized yeah especially in the whole food store mm. you know, it's just <laughs> it's a battlefield yeah <laughs> the whole food store in glastonbury is a battlefield people wear masks and don't wear masks and all that stuff and all i want is kindness mm. you know, so. i think i'm rooted in carl rogers approach like d deeply deeply committed to that as, as as a way of understanding my my experience of spirituality too i would say although you can be an atheist person-centered practitioner of course you can but i rogers was saying when you understand someone deeply from their perspective then the work their world their actions their choices make sense yeah. And when someone doesn't feel attacked and threatened, 
and is able to be all of their all of their experience without feeling in any way threatened or challenged then they will be able to change and i i find that to be true yeah. so yes that being with being kind love is underpins it all i think and, and good psychiatry also sits in the same place let's accept the reality of the mm. person's state mm. first of all accept accept that you know it's um, my experience of hospice spiritual mm. care and a little bit in unis and a little bit in schools is volunteers who come in to give spiritual pa pa care pa pastoral support they come in a little bit like um, self-important busybodies. Okay. And they kind of walk around as if they're kind of school prefects in the corridors of their school, right? And then, and then they get to their client, patient, and whoop, they do the job. There's a cup of tea, dear, you know? And there's this kind of... Um, almost charade of giving care and and they're quite protective of their territory mm. they're quite protective of their territory um, i've encountered that a lot and heard a lot about that happening in hospices right yes. and and to name it at its worst in um areas which are upper middle class and there's a hospice that's upper middle class then the, the volunteers tend to be upper middle class Christians who are finding some little bit of status and self-importance and they're, they're jealous of their territory mm. and they don't want mm. a spiritual, not religious person like you to yeah. come in. And there's, there's culture politics going on at that level. Have you, have you experienced any of that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I think, uh, yes, I have. I have experienced both in hospice and, and in, and in, higher education too yeah. in hospice and like i notice i react to your language that's yeah. a bit oh i'm happy to have it corrected um no no just the 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 busy body that it, it feels it was rude yeah I, I was being i was i was being rude yes but yeah i do think that the and maybe it's in the something in the shadow of of the hospice world and because i i experience it not just in chaplaincy but in sometimes in the nurses and other people too is there's this idea of we come in here because we are doing something good we are enabling people to to die comfortably and we're doing something good and yet the reality is that in most hospices it caters for white mainly middle class people those are the families that use hospices often and people who don't fit can be labeled and judged in hospices you know as not being a good enough patient or not behaving in the way that they should and yes yeah, so i think there is a culture sometimes where people feel that they're doing doing good and people should be grateful and appreciative mm. of what of yes. what they see yes squirmy isn't it yeah it is it is yes we've got two on. questions that have come in first of all it's been wonderful listening to you both and lisa what an amazing story thank you very inspiring <laughs> i feel parts of myself and my journey in your story and it um makes me feel stronger so thank you mm. in my choices i appreciate that um, the two questions that have come in the first one is how has the chaplaincy or spiritual care service at uni changed since you've been there? Mm -hmm. okay. And then the second question is, what is your definition of spirituality? Okay. Ooh. Very easy question. Yeah, good, good, good luck with the second one. <laughs> well, I have to say, I mean, this is not a cop out, but when I'm trying to define spirituality at the university and talk to my colleagues in student services and student well-being is I generally use our spiritual companions definition William so 
yeah, I haven't come up with a better definition. Can you articulate it for people who don't know it? I think, so it's about, for me it's about what, what, in what ways we feel connected and what helps us to, to develop that experience and explore the meaning of it for us. I can't, I, I can't remember it. Don't put me on the spot to quote it, but <laughs> yeah, feel what fostering, what helps us to feel connected, more deeply connected, whatever that is. And knowing that, that we have an, a desire to explore meaning for ourselves. I think those are the two components. Um, how has the how has your department changed since how has it changed how are you so, hoping, and how are you hoping to change it as well well so when i arrived there were several chaplains parts chaplains who came in all christian and there were also there's also a team of what we call faith advisors and they come from different faith backgrounds muslim sikh hindu buddhist humanist um no pagans, no, there's a Quaker. Yeah, no, but they are all people who work in the university, but are willing to be called on if we have students of faith. So in addition to those two teams. What kind of roles do they have in the uni? Oh, all sorts. So it might be a lecturer. So what our Islamic faith advisor is a lecturer in biomedical sciences. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they may be an administrator, they might be um, a lecturer, they, they, all sorts of different roles, but they are willing to be called on if a student says, I want to talk to someone from my faith background, or if they have a question and we need to find out something. We do all sorts of weird things, like have to answer questions about, you know, well, would this be appropriate? If we word things like, I don't, there was a recent complaint in the cafe about serving Buddha bowls and was that an offensive term so we talked to our Buddhist faith advisor and and look at is that language appropriate for a menu in a cat excuse, excuse me excuse me miss yes what is a Buddha bowl in the university canteen so well Buddha bowls are a it's a dish that's it, well usually it would be vegetarian I think the complaint had come because there was the meat added to this okay. it would be like a superfood meal of you know lots of really kind of good green salad veggie life oh great yeah. so what what would a Jesus goulash be like <laughs> no idea <laughs> but that's next on the menu yeah I'm, I'm lowering maybe, the tone maybe Sorry. that's maybe that's my next job is to come up with a menu for pastoral <laughs> spiritual support a multi-faith menu um but no the main change that i've made so far is i've then addition i've recruited a team of pastoral support volunteers so and they come from an from non-religious some of them have a spiritual practice most of them have a spiritual practice of some kind but they're all interested in pastoral and spiritual support, but from a much broader perspective. So that team has been my first change is that we're recruiting them and training them in, you know, in the ways that in the, the same ways that, you, that you're doing courses with people. We're training in good listening, support, being confident and comfortable about talking about spirituality. Um, where it's appropriate but also just being willing to be kind people who will hang out with students and staff who need them so. i've got a query yeah actually plant medicines and ayahuasca and lsd and ecstasy is that cropping up as part of the stuff that you have to deal with it hasn't so far okay. i'm not I'm not saying it wouldn't no it, I'm really aware of the time, but also that it, an interesting thing happened was I had one student come and see me was one of the counseling team suggested she come and see me and talk to me and she has explored her own spirituality in a much more broad way, but is really interested in um, alternative spiritualities using the tarot um wicca different models i don't have anyone to support her in that but i had a really interesting response which was i was about 
how much of that can I talk openly about with her from my own background and experience mm. and feeling at first quite inhibited about how openly I might be able to talk about that and whether that would undermine my credibility in my role. But at the same time, then thinking, well, yeah, but, you know, if a student came in and said to one of the chaplains, the Christian chaplains, will you pray with me? They wouldn't have any problem saying, yes, of course, yeah. I'll pray with you. And so, I was just thinking, you have this punk background. <laughs> yeah. So there's a kind of authenticity there. So listen, we've done our hour. Yeah, we have. You kind of say, is there anything you feel we need to? No, approach? I think you guys did great. But I would love to get this last question in. Okay. If we can just yeah. um, what if anything do you do in particular to create sacred space at the support services base has anyone noticed a lot of what i do people won't notice because mm -hmm. what i do is i think very carefully about the space. I bless the space. I set, I set the space very carefully. I create sacred space in the way I always did as a therapist, which was about just using my own very silent practices to just make a space. I also believe that all space is sacred space. So in my building, I look after it well. I make sure it's clean and tidy. I keep it clear. I, I say prayers in the space. I, I do those things, but nobody would necessarily notice them. But I have, I am careful about what's on display. I'm careful that we don't only display leaflets about Christian services, that we display things that are about other faiths, other things that are happening in Plymouth, other traditions, that we make sure that we're kind of inclusive in all of that. Um, but for me, sacred space isn't that building. For the work that I do isn't in that building. It's like it happens in the corridor. It happens standing in the queue for coffee if I go over. Or it sounds, happens in the library. It, yeah, anywhere. Wonderful. That yeah, what, what a lovely conversation we've oh, had. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you remember at the very beginning, people, I said, do you remember... Lisa's one of those people where I become like a happy dog wagging my tail I, I, when I see her. And I'm hoping, I'm sure that all of you have had a similar experience. I'm going to hand over to Sahini to thank you, com ben. complete us. Yeah, thank you for having me here. It's been really wonderful. And I, yeah, I had to just let go of where is this conversation going to go and just be in it, all my nerves. And But I've actually really enjoyed it and... Oh, you've been fantastic yeah, to listen been to. Wonderful. It's, it's really fantastic. Yeah. So and it's thank been you. Very wonderful. Mm. It's been very wonderful. And such a deep conversation for me personally. And I'm sure for everybody else as well, because it feels like I went through so many spaces and places. Um, so the another question is, is your dog here with us too? Oh. Well, she's somewhere in the house, but she's not in here at the moment. No, we, we, we did agree to leave the door open in case she I know, came. she hasn't come in. She's yeah. been like all day. She just takes herself off to bed. Yeah. So, so Hini, do you want to give, take us into a minute's quiet just to yes. close this down? Yes. So let's take a minute to just complete this lovely conversation and dialogue and um, feel the love in our hearts. So our next session is in January course and I for some reason it's on January 11th mm -hmm. same time 7 30 and it will be with Simon Stedman and it will be also a fabulous conversation so we look forward to seeing you then and have a wonderful holiday season and thank you Lisa and William and Scott for the fabulous tech support Thank you all. Oh, thank you.